You know how you get a text alert from the delivery driver before your food arrives, so your hungry kids stop freaking out? Vonage does that. Hi, good morning. Welcome everybody to PyCon Malaysia 2021. Uh, I'm Ivy Fong, the chairperson for this year. Last year when uh, 2020 comes, we're supposed to have a PyCon APEC in a beautiful state of Malaysia, Sabah, Kota Kinabalu by the sea. Uh, because of the pandemic, we won't be able to do that. And we thought that like this year, we'll be able to fulfill that dream to have it uh, there by the sea. But very quick, at the first quarter of the year, we know that it is almost impossible. So we decided to still go do online sessions for this year. Then it comes about middle of the year. The situation is not getting any better. We all know it is still kind of like the same situation as of until now. So another, another thought came to our mind. Shall we continue even in doing this uh, event? Because we have been like uh, having very little manpower because People are affected either in their job or they have to stay home, spend more time taking care of the family because their children are at home and they have to like kind of like uh, take the rules of the teacher as well. Some people uh, lost friends and family. So we decided that we do not want to uh, push anybody too hard if says that like a uh, anybody would like to uh, take a break from organizing PyCon this year because we really do not know how everybody is coping with the situations. But anyway, we still decided to go on with this uh, event, reason being that at least we can still have something like before, which is having the PyCon yearly. So with a handful of people, literally a handful of people, we continue in uh, doing, uh, having this event. And I'm, I'm glad that like, you know, along the way, there are people coming in to help and be able to get the, quite a number of volunteers uh, to help out on today because a handful of us to handle the event today, it will be very difficult. Thank you very much for those who jump in to help us. And because we do have sponsors that have been with us, for the past years and still coming back to support us for this year, we'll be able to pull this through this year and thank for their yeah, support. It's not only the monetary support, it's the moral support that they have been coming back with us like year after year that warm our heart. And we shall be uh we shall be doing that as well because like that support that 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 what keeps me going and keeps the team going and thank you very much just want to give a shout out to our sponsors that have been with us for the past years microsoft elastic vonage and we do have cytron as well coming to join us this year and in the previous year as well so i also would like to take this opportunity to shout out to those people who come and join to make this event possible. I just want to take the time to read their names out here. Uh, in no particular order, Nazmi, Mihu, Kayen, Christy, Michael, Ivan, Pan, Ashraf, Atika, Azila, James, Hilmi, of course myself, and also some other people that behind the scene that have been helping us and know who you are. Thank you very much, and I do hope to see everybody again next year. Now, without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce to you the keynote speaker for today. Um, he is a person that do not need much of an introduction. Most of you probably have already known him and know him well. 
Uh, he is Dr. Lau Chia Han, the founder of coronatrackers.com. He is the chief data scientist and keynote speaker in the field of data science and AI for major companies, organizations, government agencies across Australia, Malaysia, Taiwan, and Asian countries. He also has trained and advised many organizations, and he also currently the CEO of LEAD, L-E-A-D, and Education Institutions, currently focusing on helping clients to build their data science team. And he is also he has also launched the COVID-19 AI.org to use artificial intelligence to combat the coronavirus on a large scale. Uh, let's help me to welcome Dr. Lau on the title, The Role of Python in IR4 and Industrial Automations. Over to you, Dr. Lau. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ivy. Just, uh, okay, let me stop my camera so that everybody can see. Okay. All right, so what is the first thing that came to your mind when someone's talk about IR 4.0 in Malaysia? Okay, probably something like this, right? The flying cars. And lately, we also hear a lot of things that uh, talks about, you know, mostly the new cabinet, uh, new ministers. They aim to create five unicorn companies in the next five years. Um, some of you might be laughing right now, right? Yeah. Okay, and uh, when, whenever somebody tells me that and they are laughing, right, I always like to ask them this question. I say, what if? Okay, what if? What if this come true? <laughs> what if, what if they, they, they really come true, right? So try, try to hold your laugh for a while, okay, and hold your thoughts for a minute. Here's another question for you, okay. And what is the three hardest pieces of hardware that uh, is very hard to get right now? Okay, both, uh, you guys, are, we are, we're all in the tech scene, right? We're all in the technology space. And I think that the, the number one in they came to my mind is PS5. Yeah, There are still some stocks you know, floating around in the market, but, but the, the generous sentiment is that we, people will say, oh, it's, it's very hard to get PS5 or somebody has stocked out. They sell it at a ridiculous prices. Yeah. And the second thing will be if you are in the... Uh, you know, mining industry, uh, blockchain, then you hear some of the peers saying that it's really hard to get good graphic cards nowadays, especially the, the newer series, uh, 3090. Again, there are some stocks in the market. Uh, I, I did a quick check this morning. Um, we, we can get it in Malaysia still, but in most countries, it's still out of stock. And some of the countries, like uh, they are facing a huge shortage in electric cars as well. Yeah, and yeah, it's very hard to get, uh, especially like, for example, China, a lot of the factories, they, they halted their uh, production. So the next question for you is, do you, do you know who is responsible for all this? Yeah, anybody knows? Uh, let me know in the, in the comment. Yeah. And there's this, this company called STM Microelectrics. So if you Google it, right, it's a, it's a, it's a large company. It's the second biggest uh, electronics export in in the world, uh, in in the Europe, yeah, and it's the factory is actually in Malaysia, right at the state where I'm at. Okay, I'm in Johor right now, and it's my hometown, Moa. And most people are not aware that we we play such a significant role in the in the shortage of things that I've just mentioned, right? In the shortage of chips, in the shortage of uh, PS5 in the shortage of the, uh, the graphic cards. And the main reason behind is, of course, COVID-19. It causes uh, SDM Microelectrics. And, and you look at the maps closer, uh, another company is right beside is the Microns. Yeah? So they were the, the world-leading companies in producing chips. And if you look at uh, Malaysia, right? Our IC exports by country, we we rank around number six or number seven in the world. And if you look at the uh, the countries in front of us, there's nothing like uh, there. Those are no strangers. You know, Hong Kong, Taiwan, China, Singapore. You have TSMC, all those. But if you look at the countries behind us, there's another interesting statistics. Yeah, we are our exports is even uh, higher than US and Japan's. Yeah. So. 
the thing of the question that I've asked you earlier, right? With flying cars and unicorns in uh, in Malaysia. Why is that something that is laughable? Is it is it something that we miss out? Is it something that we did not notice, or is it something we did? Is simply that we did not do right? And uh, morning, everybody. This is Doctor Lau here, Chief Data Scientist. So today I'm going to discuss with you all together what is the role of Python in the whole uh, IR 4.0. Okay, how people have been seeing it wrongly and uh, with a twist of a little bit of AI. I'm not going into too much of the technical things. Uh, if you look at the conference schedule today, the, the speakers behind, uh, we have a very good lineup this year. They're all very technical, practitioner people. And I believe that um, a lot of people have this misconception yeah, when it comes to AI and IR 4.0, and we don't really know how they work together. And uh, I, I'm, I'm coming from three different angles. I'm coming from the uh, application side, and then a little bit of, um, looking into the future and what we can do as a, as a Pythonians, as a Python developer. And I love interactions of questions. So if you have any questions, I'll try to uh, give some time uh, for Q&A after this. Okay. Now, when everybody talks about IR 4.0, I'm sure that you have seen tons of different different versions of, you know, charts like this uh, floating around every time, where, wherever you go, yeah, which whichever conference that you go, people will be talking about. Oh, IR 1.0 is about you know mechanization, steam power, uh, steam is the thing that people talk about during the time, right? So it's the main thing. Uh, so the the main resource that's important is actually the the coal, yeah, the coal, and then we have uh, we in, invented, discovered electricity during the industry 3.0 time, and then industry 3.0 uh, time is about automation, computers, and electronics, where we use a lot of uh, fuel, uh, fossil fuels, and this is pretty much where we are right now. And when it comes to today's world, right, when it comes to 2020, and we talk a lot on the artificial intelligence. It, the entire IR, uh, Industrial Revolution, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, is all about automations, is to free labor from doing repetitive tasks uh, and boring tasks that does not have too much of the value. Yeah, the, in, in short, they do not have any creative uh, creativity. They do not have any creative value. And that's what we want to free uh, people from. A lot of people will argue and say, oh, it's about production. It's about efficiency of production, which I personally don't quite agree. If you think of it this way, right, we are currently in the stage of overproduction, right? The cost of throwing away something is a lot a lot lower than you try to repair something, right? So we we know that we are at the stage. So what what is the key resource when it comes to 2020, 2021 IR 4.0? Uh, some people will say 5G, but 5G is not a resource, right? Communication channel is always there. From industry 1.0, whether you, you're writing letters, you're sending SMS in IR 2.0, you're sending emails in industry 3.0. So IR 5.0, whether you're sending signals, you're sending videos, it doesn't matter. 5G is just a communication channel. So uh, I went ahead and Google, right? I have no answers as well, but I'll do, I'll do what you guys will do. I go ahead and, and, and Google. I said, what is the key resource in IR 4.0? And uh, some experts will say, okay, Clive Humby say, data is a new oil. Uh, okay. And then uh, Professor Andrew Ng also say that AI is the new electricity. So now we get the answer. In order for us to get to IR 4.0, we need these two things, right? We need uh, artificial intelligence and also we need data yeah, because these are the two key resources that will, that will get us to Industrial Revolution 4.0. Now, I wouldn't go too much into the artificial intelligence side as well because, uh, again, you guys might have heard of a lot of things uh, on AI and those of them on the white paper level, level um, I shouldn't need to tell you, you know, what is AGI, what is ANI, uh, that sort of stuff. It, it, you can easily find that. But what is more important is that uh, we know that data plays an important role. I, I always have this philosophy that I believe that a, uh, data 
every company will become a data company, right? Eventually, whether you like it or not. If you look at the current pandemic, you will realize that uh, a lot of you know those companies that did not sustain or did not manage to pull through, most of them is because they don't they are unable to transform themselves digitally on time. Yeah, whether they don't want to move on to a digital platform or whether they don't have enough data to tell them what's going on. Now, another exciting part for you as a Pythonian is that uh, a lot of the models, a lot of the data models that we have built in the past, pre-pandemic, pre-COVID-19, right? They pretty much, um, I wouldn't say invalid, but a lot of them, they require revalidation. So you need to retrain the model, rebuild the model, collect a lot of data to look at the entire market again. For example, tourism, airline industry. Um, nobody, uh, nobody is able to tell you that, oh, yeah, the, the, the travel industry is going to be the same uh, before COVID-19, uh, before and after COVID-19, right? That's totally wrong to say so. And the, another aspect of it is that we... When, when 5G finally arrived in Malaysia, okay, finally arrived in Malaysia, you will suddenly have access to a large number of data, large amount of data, uh, which in the scale of exponential level, yeah, you are not only getting data, you know, like, oh, we are, we are going from uh, 100 meg to 200 meg, uh, 100 gig to 200 gig, that sort of skill. Because every time when storage grows, it grows exponentially. Yeah. So you have a lot of data. And another thing is the unstructured data within it. Before this, a lot of us, a lot of companies, they only look at uh, structured data. Yeah. They only look at things like uh, numbers, records, transactions, databases. They do not look at uh, things like social medias, your behavior records, your logs. So in particular, IR 4.0, there's one important part of it, which is the census. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you are a maker or if you have been involved in any of the maker movement, right, you would have uh, got gotten some first-hand experience on things like, uh, you know, the humidity census uh, last year, uh, sorry, the year before, uh, the years before, we always have this uh, haze problem, right? So we need to use different types of sensors uh, to detect the air quality. Yeah. When it comes to uh, IR 4.0 in Malaysia, uh, let me give you an example of what I have done before in Australia. We use this uh, sound sensor. Okay. We use, today we call it sound sensor, lah, but back then we only use some uh, cheap microphones on the mobile phones. To go into the, the wildlife, to go into the jungle, to record the bird's call. Uh, uh, it was hard to do it before we have this sort of technologies. Most of the birds, they are pretty shy. And whenever they, they detect the sense of movements of humans, they, they will just fly away. But uh, see, when, when we do, when we chop down a piece of uh, a forest, right? Uh, we have this deforestation will affect the wildlife, will affect their entire ecosystems and sometimes their food chain. So what we need to do is we need to record and identify the different species, different types of birds in that particular place before we do any work. Uh, this is something that you hardly see in Malaysia. Right? When you want to chop a, a forest down, you just say, go ahead and do it. Yeah, and they, when they want to burn it, they just, they just burn it. In Australia, we don't do that. And after that, we, we record their, their birds' calls, and sometimes we are able to identify some birds that uh, they are rare, some bird species that are rare, and they are, they are about extinct as well. We are able to detect that, and we put it into uh, systems to analyze that uh, using Python, and then we publish the data and our research outcomes uh, on the internet for the researchers from other countries to be able to use the result and uh, share the outcome of our work. Now, if, if this is a bit uh, like you, you can't really imagine what is happening here using the sound sensors, this is something that you must have seen before, right, uh, using drones. So a lot of the companies in uh, Malaysia as well, they, they like to talk about um, drones technologies, but nobody really put up uh, 
uh, drone applications to the consumer level yet. Yeah, it happens in the uh, architecture, uh, sorry, agriculture levels and in the plantation. Uh, one thing about drones is that you can't expect the drones to run all the real-time analysis like image processing, for example. You can, we don't have the computing power to run live OpenCV on top of that. But what we can do is we usually get the drones and to become a data collector. So if we have drones uh, flying around in a plant in, in a plantation like this, uh, say in a palm oil uh, farm, you can use it to spot fires. Right? You can use it to do a lot of monitoring in the remote and inaccessible areas. A lot of times we don't realize uh, the or we can't feel the benefits of these sort of new technologies in Malaysia is because of the cheap labor costs as well, and we have. We imported a lot of foreign labels, so we 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 can't really um, appreciate uh, what, what is the benefits of using that and how much labor cost you can save because the investment of a technology, uh, IR four point zero technology like this, is quite high. So most of the Chinaman uncle will say, "Oh, you know, this is too expensive." I don't forget for palm oil, yeah, we are we are even stronger. If our chips and IC exports are number two, uh, so are number six in the in the world, for palm oil, we're we're ranked number two in exports, right behind Indonesia. So there are a lot of things that we can do in um, in palm oil industry or in in the agriculture side, we can use it to detect pests and we can use it to reduce a lot of unnecessary work hazards as well. Now, another thing that I personally like a lot uh, when it comes to things like 5G is uh, the innovations in robotics. Uh, when it comes to robotics, of course, people will, first thing that came to your mind, of course, is Tesla, right? Okay, Tesla announcement, uh, and that it attracts a lot of attention. But for, for most people, when it comes to the uh, robotic side is not so much about uh, making it cool. Again, you can't really, it's not commercialized yet to the level that you see a lot of robots running around, or at least those robots that, that work for us, it does not look in the form of a uh, humanoid like what you have seen in the picture here, right? And when it goes to, say, uh, some of the places like they say they use robotics. Before, before that, people will be thinking like, oh, this what what does these robots do? If you if you watch a lot of the mainstream media, you the robots inside your head will be more like Sophia, right? Sophia type. Uh, just somebody will be able to chat with you, communicate with you. And that's I, I believe that there's another areas that people uh, have been, I would say, explore in the slightly outside of the, of the track because. Say, for example, they say robots must have emotions, ro robots must be able to have cognitive uh, recognitions and able to understand that. I don't quite agree with that because um, we humans have those sort of feelings and senses is to trigger some psychological, uh, sorry, biological responses like your adrenaline rush, uh, your, your emotions. But robots don't have to do that because you have other types of senses, like for example, uh, the your cameras is your eyes, we use it to do different types of visions, and then your actuations, your arms, your, your speed, etc. But only until lately, right? Again, yeah. Again, COVID-19. When COVID-19 comes, a lot of people start to think about, oh, we need to, we need to reduce uh, that sort of like human touch. We need to reduce uh, human interactions because we are relying too much on, on manual stuff. Okay? We're relying too much on the, uh, those human interactions. And that's what basically a lot of the factories causes uh, the, the virus to spread. And that's true, okay, that's true to a certain extent. And in in the entire world, right, we are doing our very best to fight with COVID, right? Now, I have another question for you. <laughs> Who is responsible for that yeah, when we are trying to fight COVID? Again, it's, it's us Malaysian, yeah? Because we are the world number three in rubber production. So we are faced with a huge issue here with rubber shortage yeah uh, with glove production because we don't have enough rubber tapper rubber tapper those uh uncle aunties that go out in the morning early in the morning three four o'clock go into the uh the, the plantations and then they they, they tap the rubbers uh, okay in, in chinese we say we, we cut the rubbers um because of urbanizations right not many people wants to stay in kampong and continue with this sort of 
labor intensive job whether is it because of the social status or whether is it because of the income income is something that you can still uh justify that means if they make enough money they'll increase your your minimum pay so to speak right but the problem is more on the social side uh no no parents that I know, I, I grew up in Moa, so my my grandparents were, were there before they, they passed away. They, I hardly see any of my uh, my uncle, aunties, they would, they would educate their son, say, oh, you know, you you work hard, you grow up well, and then you can be a rubber farm uh, owner, or you can be very good in tapping rubbers, you have a great future. No, they usually use this as, a, as the opposite. Uh, thing or a negative thing to educate my nephew and nieces say, hey, you, you better study well so that you can go down to KL or go to GB to work yeah otherwise uh, in the future you you don't know what to do yeah and and Moa is at a very strategic location because we are two hours away from both airports if you drive up north two hours you go to KL you drive down south two hours you go to JB. So we you 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 get the sentiments. Yeah? So this is another areas where uh, robotics uh, IR 4.0 can come in very handy. In China there's this mud rubber tapping system. Okay it has very precise uh, it's a very precise system all the way from fertilizations using the right amount of pesticides to prevent diseases, get rid of pests and uh, weeds. And this is to significantly to reduce the amount of losses when, because it takes about, on average, it takes about seven to, uh, six to seven years just to grow uh, a, rubber, a rubber tree. Now, if you take these to other kind of, uh, other kind of trees, right, whether it's a durian tree, it's a palm oil, uh, we, have, we face similar problems as well. And think about the food, the, sort of, uh, the fruits and the vegetables that we eat. We are always... Uh, facing the problem of the pesticides as well. So these are the smart systems, smart IoT systems, right? Um, it, it significantly reduces a lot of problems that we, we, we might not have think about. We always think of, you know, uh, robots is a way to automate, uh, to reduce human labor, like I've mentioned before. And up until this part, right, every time when I make my presentations, uh, people are happy. Uh, until when I start to talk about labor, uh, capitalists are happy. You know, bosses are happy to see whatever ways they can re reduce the reliance on manpower. But at the same time, like I say, they do not like to invest. Yeah, they do not like to invest this sort of thing. So they are waiting for grants and they are waiting for people to give them free trials. Do I found out those uh, agencies that comes in? And on the, on the people side, right, on the human side, uh, one of the funny things that I notice is that people think that we are cool when we say sensor, when we say IoT, we are helping the farmers. Uh, but when we say something like robotics, uh, it, it, essentially they are pretty much the same thing, right? Whether this is uh, IoT robots or these uh, IoT sensors, in the eyes of, of us as a, as a programmer, it, it, there's no significant difference, I put it this way. Uh, but when we say IoT, when we say sensors, people will think that you are the good guy. Okay, you're helping the farmers, you know, you're, you're nice. But when you say something like robotics, uh, people start to get upset. Okay, they become very defensive. They say, well, you're trying to reduce manpower. You're trying to steal people's jobs. Yeah? Let, let's take another closer look to the uh, rubber tapping industry, right? The rubber tapper's life. When, when rubber tappers think that we are trying to steal their rice bowl, now, in, in some countries, uh, the job occupancy rate is as low as 50% only. Right? This is a video that I got it from, from China. And many people can't work as a uh, tapper because they have eyesight problems. So they have uh, spine issues, they have spinal issues as well. So they, they can't work for too long durations and they, as they, as they get older, it's not really suitable for them to work in an environment like that. And the, like I said earlier, right, there are a lot of different types of work hazards there. You know, you have snakes and uh, different types of uh, natural hazards there. So from a, from a more realistic standpoint, and their performance is inconsistent as well. And they need to be well experienced and fast enough. For those of you who have not tried tapping rubber before, right, you need to be very fast. Yeah, if you if you're a bit slower, the drama will dry up. Yeah, the, the juice will dry up. And as you can see, like, this is not an, an ideal and healthy working environment. But rubber is still one of the key 
resources, especially in today's situations uh, when we, we need that a lot when fighting with COVID-19. Yeah. So you have a bit of, um, I painted a bit of like a big pictures, a good overview that so that you, you understand about what is IR 4.0, uh, what are the opportunities that we, we have it here, and what are the potentials that we might not have noticed as a Malaysian ourselves, right? So where is our, uh, where, where are our opportunities from there? And I know many people in Malaysia, right? They don't look up to programmers. They don't think, some people, they don't think we are professionals. And especially those of us who are working behind the scene, right? We are not the one uh, dressed up uh, funky and hold a cup of coffee, Starbucks coffee, whenever we go for meetings and stuff. And I... How bad is the situation? Eh? Uh, let me share, share with you a story. I spoke to a guy who developed a COVID system lately. So he's like a very introvert guy, a very shy person, like, like most of us here. You know, programmers, we, we, we deal with codes, we deal with uh, machines, computers. So I asked him a reason. I asked him, say, hey, uh, what is the stack that you are using uh, to develop the COVID system? Because it's an open source system, right? He's like, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Lau, I can't tell you that you know, for some reason. I was like, what? It's, a, it's an open source project. So for, for whatever reasons that you can't share the details. Uh. And that, that's another reason I, uh, I, I still Apple keynote style for this presentation. Uh, you probably noticed by now. yeah. Because just in case uh, you are shy uh, to say that you are a programmer, somebody bump into this and you can tell them, oh, I'm watching an Apple keynote, you know, just in case. A joke aside, now uh, if you think about IR 4.0 and you don't see that as an individual event, okay? So do not see IR 4.0 as an individual event as, as part of the historical movement because we are part of the history. It's a milestone, it's an outcome. And if we if we smartly apply AI and data together in you know, providing solutions to the current problems. Now your your interest, your, your, your sole interest or your core interest might not be in IR 4.0, especially like the examples that I use are more in the, uh, say, agriculture industry because I'm, I'm showing you what our country is, is strong, is good at, and a lot of us didn't know. But there are many industries, there are many different areas that you can use AI and data smartly to play a huge and significant role to contribute to IR 4.0, yeah? So let's look at this, uh, this chart, right? For example, uh, online service. You want to innovate the industry, say uh, logistic, uh, logistic industry. So you, you will be thinking, so uh, in logistic industry, how we can smartly use AI to optimize your route, okay? We want to uh, optimize our delivery experience, say for example that, and like, uh, they are HR companies, right? They are working uh, towards using AI and data to improve their job-seeking experience and processes. So they want to short-circuit the entire process of, you know, you go home and wait for three days and you know, eventually three days after three days, nothing will happen. And also they are, it's like matchmaking. If you think about it that way, right? I always tell the HR people that yeah, you, you are like a matchmaker, uh, except this, you know that the, your customers will, will come back to you more often. And if you think about it in those sort of industry, there's a there's an imbalance supply uh, of supply and demand. Just like when you look at, let's say, cars, car sales. Uh, uh, like recently, why Carsum has uh, is able to get such a good and high valuations for the same reason. You are, you, are, you are doing matchmaking as, as well. And it's an imbalanced matchmaking. You have a lot of people that are trying to sell their cars, but you have relatively less people uh, who wants to buy a car at a much lower frequency. You don't buy cars every day. You buy cars every three to five years, and some, for some people, five to 10 years, right? But you have people who, who wants to sell car every day. Same goes to job hunting. Yeah? You want to look for a job. Ideally, you will just want to look for one good job and stay in the job as long as you can. But there are many companies who are hiring actively. So when it comes to a situation like this, a platform, uh, online services, AI data will will have will play a significant role. Yeah, if you can if you can solve the problem of that sort of shortage, you 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 do well. And second thing is the business valuation. So as we move up the uh, the the stacks, right, the value goes up. 
and the time taken is is also significantly longer. So you can use AI to automate everything uh, from fintech, digital banking, education, supply chain management, and customer service. Now these are the examples. These examples that I've just mentioned are those industry or those uh, business operations that have long due for. Uh, a refresh and innovation, and yet we have not seen that happening. For example, banking, right? We have been using the same old banking system for many years. We go into a bank, you want to apply for a loan, you want to apply for a credit card. They still look at your three month salaries, basically, whatever it is, right? These are the basic things. But if you look at the upcoming new banks that Grab Asia are looking at, they are looking at your behavior, they are looking at your behavioral data, they are looking at your uh, shopping uh, preferences and they are using all these sort of social aspects to uh, judge you and to give you a credit. Now, of course, you might you might want to challenge that or argue that idea a little bit on the privacy and or at least the use of your personal data. But that's a, a topic for another day. And if we can look at something with a bigger scale like education or supply chain management, these sort of things, right? Our education system is like 150 years old and we are still using the same education system that expects everybody should be the same, should get the same score uh, as a zero-sum game after they have graduated from high school. Now, this is something that is fundamentally wrong if you want to move towards a uh, high-income uh, developed country. Yeah? And then we have something that's even more challenging like uh, re uh, physical services, for example, retail, IoT, uh, smart city and smart home. Uh, smart home recently received quite a bit of attention here and then uh, a lot of the new houses, uh, developers, housing projects, they, they start to install uh, smart home solutions, which is good. And uh, for retail, right, because of the uh, COVID, because of the pandemic, so we, we, we have to look for different ways to innovate the business itself. And we still have to, for some services, the, like for example, haircut, uh, beauty, uh, beauty parlor, that sort of industry, service industry, uh, you can't really, you can't, you can't just move it online, right? You still, you can't just cut your hair on the cloud. You still need somebody to do that for you. But these sort of physical services, we can, we can smartly use technologies uh, to help us to innovate that. And lastly, is the fully automated solution. So you are, you are providing the solution as for the entire industry. So it's more of a vertical integration rather than the online services, they are more individual services, but fully automated solutions are more integrated solutions. And you are looking at the entire vertical industry. So whoever that can do this will make big bucks Yeah, in, in, uh, in terms of billions, like uh, Tesla, SpaceX, those sort of things that Elon Musk are doing. He's not doing something that is I mean, I'm not being arrogant here, but whatever things that he 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 did, right? If you if you take them apart, is nothing, um, nothing fundamentally groundbreaking. Okay, to be politically correct, but the hard part is he's able to do that all together. Yeah, with his his and his team capability. So to integrate uh, the entire, um, let's say the the aero, aero aerospace industry, right? Using SpaceX, that is something that's interesting. Okay, that's something that's uh, innovative. And together, I believe that we as a programmer, we are able to work hand in hand together to, to do things right, right. If we do these things that I mentioned right, we're able to end COVID ASAP, yeah, end COVID-19 earlier. And together, we work towards ending the world hunger. So these are, these are the top issues that where the United Nations, WHO, they, they're always constantly reminding us that we have to do this. But of course, as a Malaysian, we work hard because, not to be forgotten, we have a water crisis. Yeah, before we can end food hunger, before we can end COVID nineteen, let's also think about ourselves. Yeah, not to be forgotten, we have some water crisis here. We need to solve. So, uh, what is our role as a programmer? Right, like I mentioned earlier, yeah, people don't look up to to programmers, and they they feel shy to to admit that they are programmer. So I, I, to me, I, I hate the term uh, even for somebody to call us a coder. I don't know who came up with the term coder just because somebody who write code, but 
I I somewhat feel like is is implying a system, you know, a hierarchy system. Say, oh, this guy write codes, and then after you have moved on from writing codes level, you are able to write some programs, and then they call you a programmer. <laughs> and then after you become a programmer, then they will say, oh, this one, this guy, uh, this guy is a developer, or this guy is a web developer, and they say, oh, this guy is a is a system system guy. Yeah, okay, and they they sort of like implement a, a a hierarchy among us. And they they make us fight in a way, right? But I strongly believe that technology is agnostic. Yeah, as somebody who who is a who is a tech guy who loves technology so passionately, I I don't think we should just call ourselves a coder. Okay, we are not really a programmer as well. Program is something like. Uh, in certain contexts, they give you something that is have a negative feeling. Oh, this guy is being programmed to do something. You know that system can only be programmed to do a thing specifically. Do you want to program your microwave oven? Do you want to program your speech? Uh, sorry, your fridge, and you know, something programmable chips. You know, some sounds sounds like sounds very artificial and not. Uh, we are not just a programmer, okay? And of course, we are not a developer. Developer, uh. In in these M shaped societies, we have a lot of developers who are making good money, uh, for senior developers, and they eventually become CTO or they founded their own startups. But we have a lot of junior developers as well. I believe that uh, you guys have seen a lot of them. I'm I felt like yeah, I felt sorry for them because they they as a junior developer, they always need an opportunity to work. But the companies do not give us an opportunity to do so. They say, "Oh, you're a junior, so you cannot work on a larger project." And but then when they say they want to become a senior, they expect to have they expect to have experience. So who are we really? Okay, I think we are engineer. Yeah, we we are really engineer, and not only we're engineer, we're engineer for the mankind. We are engineering for a better future. Now, as a as a technical guy. I whenever I make a remark like this, I always think that you know this is something that is a bit, uh, a bit not really, re not really my my type of thing. Because if you think about it, right, we are really really engineering the future. So ever since the the first uh, Apollo Eleven that was built, we started to explore things that is outside our imagination. That's outside whatever we can see, right? Even, even things that you we don't think we before we know that there's a moon out there. And JFK says that oh, we want to send men to the moon and make sure they are able to come back safely. And then lately, uh, we have this discovery of the black hole. We finally proved that is. Is there and we are able to take a picture of it. And by the way, this is made with NumPy Python, if you are not aware. And if you think that you know the two examples that I've given is a bit too far-fetched, let's pull it back to something that's closer to us. Okay. We engineer, we engineer a lot of things, we engineer recommendation systems, we use it in our life, recommending songs when you don't know what songs to listen, you don't even know what songs that you like, recommending uh, YouTube videos so that you can learn a lot of new things every day on a daily basis. You get your entertainment and it replaces the traditional, boring, ineffective televisions. And of course, like recommending books when you are shopping in Amazon, right? So that you can spend more money in Amazon. And then this guy will be able to make more money for him to launch more spaceships. Now, if you are, if you are not uh, aware, right, when... When uh, Jeff Bezos, okay, uh, or Blue Origins, like, yeah, they launched the uh, New Shepard. We they use Python extensively, yeah, in the visualizations, in simulation, and in testing. So I believe that, okay, we are we engineers, right? To engineer is human. Whoever uh, to your friends, uh, let them know that you know I'm not just a programmer. I'm not just a coder. I'm not a developer only. We're engineers, and everything starts from here. Okay. Hello, world. All right. Thank you very much. That's uh, this Dr. Lau here. That's my simple uh, keynote on the R4.0 and the role of Python. Uh, let's go and do some Q&A.
Hey, is Michael and Ivy here? So we got uh, a comment from Mr. <laughs> Robot in the art. Uh, some uh, actual program to be angry. Okay, let's look at Valdez, Mr. Valdez. Uh, yeah. Valdez said, yeah, curious with the circuit Python talk later. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited as well, right? Like, seriously, when I look at the, the lineup today, I'm, I'm very excited. Because this is the... I, I hardly see any sort of like, rarely see, like, especially in the past two years, right? The, the technical talks of this, this level in, in Malaysia, there are a lot of talks going, going around uh, in terms of uh, things like, I don't know, finance, you know, bitcoins. Uh, my background is in data mining, by the way. Yeah, when I, when I started as a, as a student, uh, we do data mining. So whenever we tell people, last time, uh, data mining is a transition keyword, okay? Not, not as cool as data scientists because mining itself makes you look like a, a label to, who, who mine data for a living. And then in today's world, of course, I can't just say, oh, you know what? Hey, I do data mining for a living. <laughs> and next moment, people will come and ask me about, you know, what, what do you do for a living? Uh, you, you sell Bitcoin, is that? Yeah. AIV is back. AIV. Hi, sorry, uh, leaving you there to, to handle the situation for no, a while. No, I'm, I'm, I'm so used to it. I, I love being on stage. I miss being on stage. <laughs> yeah, I think that like, we all have been like, you know, away, especially on the real stage for quite some time. So yeah. uh, let me just pick, uh, yeah, I think the question is being posted. Yes. Yeah. So if you guys can help me to pick a couple of questions, that'd be good. Hmm. So the question is like, would you comment on data privacy on leading for uh leading forward to IR4? Of course, this this question, I'm expecting this question. Now, when it comes to privacy, right, let's uh expand a little bit to talk about big data for a while. Yeah? Uh, when it comes to big data, I think people should focus more on the unstructured data side of things. I know that you feel uncomfortable because of uh, people are using your behavioral data, you know, your shopping transactions record to target you and then to push, like, like what I say, like, yeah, push you to, to recommend, to buy more recommended items and stuff. But there's something that's unavoidable. So, uh, of course, in, on, on one hand, I can tell you, you know, if you're not doing something wrong, you don't, be, you don't have to be afraid, you don't have to be scared. But what scares people the most is that now the, the machine seems to know us better than, than us. Yeah, the machine knows a lot more than we know about ourselves. That's, that's number one. And when it comes to privacy thing, I think there are, there are a lot more things that you should be worried about. The data got uh, into the hand of some other people uh, who have bad or ill intentions. If you compare what we are doing today, right? If you know how to use uh, SMS, 2FA, uh, that sort of technology is authenticated to protect your password, to protect your emails. It's a lot safer than putting a snail mail into your mailbox today, right? And when you're going to apply something, when you want to do some sort of online transactions, it's a lot safer, a lot more convenient than using a check, a lot more convenient than you go to a shop and say, uh, excuse me, can I scan your photocopy, your IC, both sides, and then you have to cross. This, we are actually moving towards a more improvements on that side in terms of the security side, cyber security side, identity management, identity theft. So um, yes, of course, but data privacy on this aspect that I've mentioned is more about your uh, the, the personal awareness and personal management. And of course, I hope to see that on the government level and before that will happen, right, on the corporate, uh, corporation level, they put more attentions and focus on cyber securities to protect their in-house data and to protect the, the privacy data of the customers and the users. I think that would be a, a giant, giant step, a giant leap for all of us now. All right, thank you. There is another one questions over here coming from uh, Sui Chuan Ko. In your opinion, how do parents, teacher and community leader encourage the youth the kids and the students to be interested in writing program, solving pro uh, problem with programming. Oh, that's the questions that I really like to know as well. I do have, I myself do have two nephews that like, you know, kind of like always ask me, no, I want to learn programming. But in their mind, sorry, uh, switch one, I, 
I steal your questions a little bit because I do have the same the same same kind of like a comment uh, uh questions in in my mind as well that they were keep on asking me but do, if I learn this can I make money I mean I don't know how the kids nowadays they like you know do have this kind of thinking in their mind but that's the questions I get from 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 student as well so yeah that's allowed. <laughs> Of course, when when they have an auntie as cool as Ivy, right? That that's what you'll be expected to to ask, and that's what in your in your head. Uh, I here's the thing. Uh, when you when you look at the babies, right? I look at my my one year old, uh, eighteen months old baby. He he knows how to use those things, right? Like remote control, he knows how to use, and then iPad, uh, iPhone. He just take it, and then he knows how to swipe. And I, that is that is that's one side of it, right? But if you think along that direction, is to get them interested in uh, solving problems that matters to them. It's all about themselves. It's not about any other people, you know, if you ask them, say, why, why do you want to make more money? So I want to buy more toys. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go to school. It's that sort of thing. So if you can, if we can sort of like tell them that, you know, you learn programming as a tool to help you to solve problems and to build robots, depends on what they are, their, their interest is. Like say, even if they are somebody who loves things that there's totally non, non-technical, like say uh, music, right? Uh, it requires a lot of creativity. So if we can help them like, hey, you know what? You use this Raspberry Pi and then just buy them a Raspberry Pi and a keyboard and they can use it to, to compose a song. And you can use them to compose a song that your normal normal keyboards can do, right? Your normal pianos can do, your normal organs can do. Then they'll be, they'll be interested. And same thing, if somebody is very interested in drawing, then we can teach them because I saw a question on MFT and we can tell them about things like digital arts. So how do we generate arts using algorithms and using using Python and that art can also be sold and go back to their question, right? For millions. And that, that work itself probably at a certain point, it will worth more than you know, Mona Lisa, for example. So once they're interested, you got them interested and you show them the tools and the, the top process that the, the things, uh, the problems get solved, I think they'll be very interested to learn just, just like how the, the Lego in our time. Yeah, I think, I think that'll be a good way to do so. Thank you. So I'll just bring up the questions that talking about the NFT just yeah. now. If you have any any things to add on to that? If not, then we are just... No, on. I mean, that's your question. So if, if anything, I will, I will leave it to you to answer the, on, on MIT because, because you know me, right? My take on MIT is always on the, the technical level, on blockchain, and, and I've just mentioned about the digital arts. Yeah, Yeah. before we go, in, go on to the next questions, uh, uh, why, why Dr. La mentioned that is because I, 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 in, I am also in the blockchain phase, but yeah, I'm also on to the technical side. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, from Armil, your take on Malaysia digital, my digital initiative and national policy on IR4. Are we ready? Are we really ready? Mm, depends. All right. If we say that we are ready for IR4.0, short answer definitely not. We are most of the companies, 90% of the companies in Malaysia, they are SMEs. So, like I, I mentioned during the talk, right? They are they are all about government grants, you know, wait and see, you know, big brothers don't do anything. I, I don't follow, yeah? When big brothers do it, you know, well, then I follow. And if we look at the different pillars, I it goes back to the previous question is that uh, a lot of things that we did not address, for example, gender equality, okay? And when, when people say about gender equality in programmings and in tech, right, it's not so much about, oh, we have too many guys working in this industry. It's not that. I hate it when media portray it that way, say, we, we don't have that. Uh, we, we have that sort of issue. Too many guys working in the industry, too little women working in the tech industry. It's not, it's not really the case. It's about the exposure to equal opportunities. The, the, I don't think the fairness is not there, but it's the exposure of the opportunities, equal opportunities there, and also the exposure of the education. How many people outside us, outside this community that's listening to this PyCon here, know what is Python, know what is Python doing? How many of our friends knows that Python is responsible for sending rockets, sending spaceships to, to explore the moon? Okay, not many people knows that. So who is responsible? We are also part of the responsibility. <laughs> so we, we do have to play a role. And I think that that's one of the key things in my keynote. 
to encourage people to uh, to at least to to let them know about uh, what we are doing that and i think that's to to increase the readiness level as well thank you dr love for that uh, that answer i do really agree on that one and i hope icon malaysia is here to do our little bit in that part as well and the qu next question is coming from us for achieving ir4 will it need big funding from government and can or can it be driven by individual enterprises uh, that's a good question very very good question so we look at it from uh, two different uh, perspectives right when you have big things that it does not require too much of the responsiveness it does not trigger too much of a re reactions you don't have to steer and change the the, the tracks uh, the directions then those are the things where government can do for example education is one of them right uh to push more of that sort of initiatives i like i say right i don't i don't see any problem with initiatives that uh magic uh, or mdag is is doing yeah that's from a government agencies level even from a mosti level that that is good but the big chunk of the funding that they use is always on events initiatives and then blueprints and white paper so they should they should show us what sort of implementation has been has been carried out and what is the the kpi what is the roi yeah these are the things that we they they are okay i can tell you the truth they are and you will, you will we'll probably need another one to two hours of presentation to look at those things you can question and challenge the way that they set those kpis and ROIs, but um on, on a high level so to speak they they are initiatives and they, they do put money into it but we cannot feel that okay? we cannot feel that now from individual enterprises uh, this is the thing that we can play a, a huge role Remember the four pillars that I mentioned earlier depends on the size of the company, depends on the scale of a company. You all can take part in different different side. But a lot of times, company thinks that IT guys are the one that, that spend money. Like when I remember, I, 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 I work as a programmer, I was an IT guy. And during the time, right, the the industry boomed so quickly 2000 early 2000 2000 to 2010 this is the time where you probably can see me going to speak to my boss every every six months every nine months to ask for a bigger hard disk space to ask for a faster ramp right uh sorry a bigger ramp but the problem is they don't see us they see us as a cost center every time they see this large here they also ask me for more budget but that is a signal that's a sign of growth but a lot of companies they don't see that right you ask a company to invest some money and and most of the things that i mentioned that they require upfront investment that that's the part of it and and i hope that after today's talk a lot of you will be realized that uh, on things like serverless technologies and you there are a lot of innovative and smart ways to do things without really spending a lot of money i think this is what we need to do so uh, both sides needs to need to work hard and i think we can do a lot better than what the government is doing uh in terms of pushing the initiatives yeah, yeah. uh thank you for that i think that like we should look at ourselves not as a cost center but investment center yeah correct yeah profit yeah. generation center even right yeah <laughs> all right i think we have the last questions here is also coming from our side is yes. i think on top of that how can grassroots initiated uh, initiate a movement in involving data-driven movement in order to improve our society? I think you are the best person to answer this question. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me go back to my slides. Uh, let me go back to my slides. So I have a big thank you I want to say to... Uh, uh, this is not a setup, by the way. <laughs> it, it, the question really comes on time. So a big kudos to Ivy and the PyCon team for organizing this, uh, this wonderful event. And I... I understand uh, Ivy and the team, you you are under, undergone some tough, tough times, hardship, and it's hard to get something like this done during this pandemic. I have, if, if I recall correctly, for the past 12 to 18 months, we don't really have technical events like this. We have all sort of, you know, those guru gurus event, but a meaningful technical event like this, I, I can't really remember there, there are too many. So I, I want all of us to, to take our part, right? To, to organize more community events like this, more technical events like this, and to inspire the companies to be more data-driven, to be more, to, to show them, don't tell them, okay? We have a lot of talks, conferences that tell people big data is good, okay? White paper, big data is good. You need to go, go to that side, yeah? But we shouldn't. 
Okay, we should have more actionable talks like this for our technical community. Now, if you can see my screen, right? Okay, one final closing remark that I would like to share with everybody. Next time, all right, next time, when anybody tells you that any idea is laughable, okay, you know, whether it's a flying cars, whether it's having five unicorns uh, in Malaysia, it's a laughable idea. Always ask them this, okay? What if it comes true? All right, thank you very much. This is Dr. Lau here. Hope you enjoy the rest of the PyCon. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you, the PyCon team. Thank you, Dr. Lau. And thank you, uh, everybody, for being here. And don't forget, we have a lot of lineups coming up. And the next one, uh, right away, is how to build a brand as a Python programmer, as well as informing extreme weather even event belief using uh, Earth observation, social media, and PyTorch. So bye, everybody, and see you later. And thank you, Dr. Lau. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.